Thank you very much. I, I do this a little more like a comedian, so I like walk around with the microphone. I might make sound effects, but um, it's nice to be here. I teach at a university, uh, you know, during the school year and stuff like that. You have much nicer facilities than we have, by the way, even though it's University of Georgia. This is a much nicer room to be in than places where I normally lecture. So what I'm going to do for you today is I'm going to give you 10 heresies about the modern music business. And if you don't know, it's music industry convention season right now. It starts in early February and it goes through early May. So some of these things might be a little bit in the weeds, but I'll try to explain them to you as best I can. And mostly I just kind of want you guys to have a little fun. And by the way, I just looked in the mirror and I noticed I'm wearing my Inland Empire shirt, so now I'm gonna have to explain this. Inland Empire is an area that I'm from in Southern California. It's to the east of Los Angeles. It's kind of the gray, dusty, dry, high valleys with some ranching and industry and railroads, vineyards, cattle ranches and stuff like that. And it's not the most glamorous place to be from, okay? Um, people in Los Angeles talk about this area that's nicknamed the Inland Empire. They talk about it as if, the way New Yorkers talk about New Jersey, okay? And at the same time, people from the Inland Empire kind of play that up, you know? It's like, yeah, we're kind of tough, scrappy people, you know? Everybody has big hair, we listen to country music, and we live in trailers and stuff like that, okay? So we sort of play that up. And a, f a number of years ago, but trust me, this will tie back into the story, okay? A number of years ago, it was probably two decades ago, it might, might have been that long ago, this part of California needed some imaging, you know, some new imaging, you know, because there's some beautiful things in the area and there's some great things about the area, but it's just never going to be as glamorous as the beaches or Hollywood or San Francisco and stuff like that. So they were searching for a slogan, right? And the slogan, you know, like the state of Virginia has the slogan, Virginia is for lovers. I don't know what it means, but it's, that's, our, that's a slogan in the state of Virginia. It's a nice slogan, stuff like that. So some acquaintances organized a write-in campaign for the Inland Empire that was, we will kick your ass, okay? <laughs> and they meant it in two ways. First of all, there's this stereotype that there's a bunch of tough people who live out there and they're, you know, gonna, you're gonna end up in a bar fight with the people who live out there in the Inland Empire. But we also sort of meant it as, you know, we're, we're gonna kick your ass. We're gonna show you a good time. We're gonna, you know, we're hardworking people. We're gonna get stuff done. So it, it sort of meant two things. Um, so my Inland Empire shirt here says, we will kick your ass. <clears throat> so a heresy is, let's say, a controversial or unorthodox opinion or doctrine as in politics, philosophy, or science. We have a lot of theories right now about how is the best way to approach the music business. And the, the great thing about the music business is there's no one good way to approach the music business. There are just, there's a multitude of paths and ways to be successful in the music business. But let me go back for a second. So who am I? I was in a band called Camper Van Beethoven in 19, I started it in 1983. Um, I guess we're iconic enough that Paul Rudd wore his camp, his very own Camper Van Beethoven shirt that he bought, that would have been a 1988 tour um, that he wore it in that film. So I guess we're iconic enough. Here we are in 1985 uh, playing in a record store somewhere um, wearing pretty much the same stuff that they sell in Urban Outfitters to this day. So, I mean, I feel like I'm back in the same time we were in. By the way, the guy peeking around the corner there, he's uh, an isosceles class demon. He's not visible to the naked eye, he only appears in films. <laughs> now, actually, I, I have a bunch of snapshots of our band from that time. And this guy keeps appearing in them. And we're like, who is that? I don't even know who that guy is. So apparently we summoned him when we played with certain um, intensity. 
and he would appear on the film, but not actually visible to the naked eye. And then one of the photos on the back says Doobie and Steve. So I think the demon's name is Doobie Steve. So Here's a photo of us in Madison, Wisconsin in 1987, I would say. Do you know the, the no-nos of a, the, the absolute things you do not do in a promo photo? Because we do all of them here. Look at this. Okay, first of all, no brick walls. Do you know about this? Never have a brick wall in a photo. And chain link fences and cinder block also count as brick walls. So don't do that. Uh, no shorts and wear shoes. Although, I mean, Jonathan has great legs for a man, don't you think? I mean, he's got really good legs, and he's a never nude, so he's got his short shorts on. <laughs> so, also no classic cars. That's, that's been, these are rules that actually publicists have long kept, you know? And Chris is sitting on the top of the car, so, of the truck, and, and to me that qualifies as hijinks. Right, you know, being goofy, right? It's a hijinks, right? So the only way you're allowed to have hijinks in a promo photo is if you're a ska band. And that's, I didn't make these rules up. These rules have been there forever, okay? Here's Camper Van Beethoven in 1988. We'd, been in, we'd followed the path of many indie rock bands around that time, and we were sort of one of the first ones to get a, to get in that first wave of indie rock bands that got signed to major labels. Now, everything you heard about the music business in the 1980s is pretty much true. Because, see, Victor is smoking a joint there, which has been handed to him by the senior vice president of promotion for the Virgin Records there. You know, like the number four guy in the, in the record company is like, lighting joints and passing them out to everybody. So that, that's the music business in the 1980s. It really was like that. Um, so I've been going to a lot of conventions and I was thinking about this is recently every music convention I've been going to, everybody's talking about data. And I just want you to, without judgment, or maybe with a lot of judgment, compare the first South by South West that I went to in 1987 where all the executives were looking for drugs and, and the bands as well to the 2016 South by Southwest Music Business Conference where everybody was talking about data. And I decided I'm never going to South by Southwest again, okay? There's these headlines like this. Will big data write the next hit, hit song? We're really obsessed with data right now in the music business, and I'll explain why. It's actually for a bad reason. I'll explain why in a minute. But will big data write the next big hit song? No, but drugs can write the next big hit song, I'm pretty sure. And here are some things that are more likely to inspire the next big hit than big data, okay? A good girlfriend or boyfriend inspire lots of hit songs, right? But a bad boyfriend, girlfriend generally inspires better hits. <laughs> and a really bad boyfriend or girlfriend inspire those really great hits. But also madness inspires many great hits. And drugs again, so there we go. So in 1992, uh, my band Camper Van Beethoven had sort of gone on hiatus, so it would go on hiatus for about 10 years. And I started this other band called Cracker. And we briefly started this craze whereby you wore um, long johns under your shorts. This was because we were filming outside in Virginia in January, and it was like eight degrees. And we put this stuff on while they were setting up the camera shots. And then, you know, we were supposed to then sort of, everybody wore long baggy shorts in the 90s, I'm sorry. I didn't, it's a terrible look. But anyway, 
We're wearing brightly colored long johns under our shorts. This is a really big hit. This is sort of, uh, and this is something you'll discover in the music business. You'll, you'll write a song in like five minutes and then it'll generate like 80% of the revenue uh, that you'll ever make in the music business. Um, and you're like, wow, I think I wrote that song in six minutes. So the other 20 years had very little effect on the actual revenue that I generated. This is actually important to understand the music business. Okay, so that's in 1993, that becomes a hit. And, and, and then there's another thing, this song became a big hit. Uh, that album came out at the, that album came out at the end of 93. So then this becomes a big hit off this record, and then this becomes a big hit off this record. It's a long story why I'm wearing a white cowboy hat. But um, by this point, we had three songs on MTV and various formats of rock radio. We were like selling like 20,000 records a week, and we're playing at the, I think one of your instructors here just told me he saw us at the Aragon Ballroom in Chicago and crowd surfed. You know, this is, this is, this is the height of the 90s sort of alternative rock period. And, you know, I got to ride this crest here. We did, we had a few more singles here. This was in 1996. Uh, the music business had so much money at this time uh, for making videos that we actually just hired Harry Dean Stanton to be in our video. And you just did those kind of things in those days, all right? So I've kept making records, though, and uh, somewhere around this, somewhere after 96, maybe around 2000, we start orienting ourselves more towards Americana, which we've always played Americana in, in the bands or, you know, sort of country rock and stuff like that. Here I did a duet with Patterson Hood of the Drive-By Truckers in 2009. Uh, that same album, actually, this song is featured pretty pom prominently in Californication. Um, in 2000, end of December of 2014, we put out a double album. So still making music with both my bands. Still, at least, yeah, hey, we're in Rolling Stone. You know, we're still getting some attention. We, we're still out there plugging away. I feel like I've had three separate careers with just the band Cracker, and then two separate careers with the band Camper Van Beethoven that preceded it. I'm also a producer of some note. I don't know if you've ever heard of this band. To the guy with the funny hair. So uh, I produced this record too, and I'm also one of the members of the band. So, I mean, I'm a kind of all over the place. You might know this. Um, hundreds of songs in commercials, hundreds of, well, maybe not hundreds, but dozens of songs in films and television shows. Two thir 2013 alone, we had tracks in Perks of a Wallflower, Young Adult, Wolverine, Rectify, CSI. But I will have to say that the, my crowning achievement in the music business was in 2015, and this placement, original tracks that Camper Van Beethoven wrote for this movie is perhaps my crowning achievement. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you something about this. With Camper Van Beethoven and Cracker, we have a long history of having these songs and these B, B movies that actually get played for a pretty long stretch of time. Like, uh, I make my kids think, uh, I have a picture of Jack Black in the hallway of my house, because, and I make my kids thank Jack Black every once in a while. Thank Jack Black. And the reason is, is if you see year one, when the credits start to roll, it plays one of my songs called I See the Light, and it rolls for six minutes, the whole song. And I don't know if you know how public performance royalties works, but having your song played for six minutes, even if it is at 2.30 in the morning after that Taco Bell run, if you know what I'm talking about, um, that adds up to a lot of money. So... Hopefully Sharknado does the same thing for me as well, too. Sharknado 3. So why should you listen to me? Why is my advice relevant? It isn't really, and one of the things I'm gonna tell you in this very speech is not to listen to people like me, okay? I'll explain why, okay? 
Well, first of all, as a pioneer of the indie rock movement, independent label that we established in 1985. By the way, notice the typeface there. Notice how the C isn't quite in the right spot, and the V and the A are not quite in the right spot. So when you made an album cover in those days on your own, you got this package in the mail, and they gave you this blue line grid with some paste and some letters, and you got this little kit to make your own album cover. And right before I put it in the mail, I scraped half the letters off of the paste-up board. And so I just put them on there really quick and then shipped it off And years later. So this is a reproduction of this album cover by Cooking Vinyl, and they actually left the letters improperly lined up. So anyway, that's the auspicious start. You should also realize, the other reason you should listen to me is I was crazy enough to release an Americana record at the height of grunge. We were up, Cracker was up for best, MTV's best new artist in 1992 against Nirvana. We didn't even go. I mean, we were like, we're not gonna win. It's not, we're not even going. So we didn't even go, okay? Uh, I also am crazy enough to go and have, we went and played patrol bases in 2009 in Iraq with, I don't know if you know this, but this is the uh, 34th Inter Infantry, Minnesota 34th Inter Infantry Division uh, that we went with to Iraq. We played all these patrol bases. Um, pretty, pretty interesting thing to have done in my life. And then... The other reason you should probably listen to me is that I wrote this blog in uh, October 20th and said, Spotify has apparently failed to license account and pay on more of than 150 Cracker and Camper Van Beethoven songs, so I filed a class action suit against them. That's the other reason you should probably listen to me. I actually, they're listening to me now. They didn't listen, look what happened to them. Technically, I'm just gonna make a brief comment about this. A lot of people don't understand this. I'm not suing personally for $150 million. In fact, I don't even know where that $150 million comes from. I think that's what press reports estimated the liability would be. What I did is I initiated a class action on behalf of unlicensed, unpaid songwriters because it appears that a large portion of the compositions, the songs, don't have proper licenses. I don't have anything against streaming. I don't have anything against Spotify. But am I the only one who fucking cares about the rules here, to quote the big Lebowski? Do you, if you, I mean, if we're going to have a fair digital music ecosystem, the first thing you do is you start following the rules. So we don't have an executive branch that can fix this problem because our copyright office has no enforcement uh, of has no enforcement authority in the United States. Our Congress is completely dysfunctional. Our trade organizations are either inept or corrupt. Either one, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing. So the last thing that we have left is the courts. And the thing that a court can do that nobody else can do is they can actually sit there, look at the situation, go, okay, there's a mass number of infringements. If you, the service, does this, if you, the publishers, do this, if songwriters do this, um, we're going to wipe the slate clean and we're going to start over. Yeah, I mean, if you're Spotify, you probably don't want to pay 40 million, 50 million, 80 million, 100 million in royalties and penalties, but that's the only way forward for the streaming services. They have tons of unlicensed songs unless a court steps in and creates a settlement, this problem doesn't go away. So, also, this was just pointed out to me by my student, assist, uh, my teaching assistant at the University of Georgia. She goes, I know why you're like you are. And I was like, I, how am I? Which I, I guess it means that I get into these, I will, I will pick these seemingly unwinnable battles and she was right, I looked this up. This is apparently some distant relative of mine. There was actually a civil war within the civil war in North Carolina where, by, and there's a war named after it, it was the Lowry War. This is like some cousin or nephew of a fifth or fourth or fifth great-grandfather. Um, 
they fought the Confederacy in North Carolina, they waged a guerrilla war. So better listen to me. Somewhere that's in my blood. Regardless, I somehow managed to have five gold and platinum albums as performer, songwriter, and producer. I ran a recording studio complex for 20 years. Um, here's me after I testified uh, on Capitol Hill to the, the House's subcommittee on intellectual property in the courts. That's Chairman Goodlatte, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if I'm showing a dance move. <laughs> I'm not really sure what's going on there. So, I've been a strong critic of digital revenues and Silicon Valley. Um, let's, let's be clear here, too, though, first of all. I wouldn't trade the music business that we have now for the one that we have in the 80s because you have so much more creative freedom now. You really are able to do whatever you want and release it directly to your fans. If I want to make a 40 minute song that's just classical guitar and bass drum and me reading epic poetry, which actually I'm doing right now, I can do that. There's nothing to stop me, you know? Even when I was on an indie label back in the 80s calling my own shots, I mean, I had to get a distributor to distribute that, you know? And I had to people, get people to give me rack space in the, in the record stores, you know, to display this product and to sell it. It's incredible, the world we live in now, creatively. The problem is that music is consumed more than it's ever been consumed in our lifetimes, and we're getting less of the revenue. So this is like a labor protest or something, right? So I wrote these blogs. Uh, here's one, I just, I mean, I just wrote a headline, a paragraph, and I put my royalty statement up there, and this like got like three million views on it, right? And here's another one who I'm talking about, payola, um, the modern day algorithmic payola, I won't go down to the weeds on that. But I have this blog and it's become pretty influential. So much so that, you know, New York Times wrote an article on me, right? Um, by the way, those are not Lowry's in the background. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, the, yes, that's Lewis and Clark, actually. I found those at a, those were at a yard sale. So they're awesome. But. Silicon Valley doesn't like me very much as I, I'm a real pain to them. And uh, so I get a lot of unkind blogs. Although, David Lowry wants a pony. <laughs> Are we 13? I mean, that's all you got? Okay. Anyway, besides, I want a brony. Okay, if they knew anything about me. <laughs> <clears throat> I was a mathematician at UC Santa Cruz. Um, Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics. How's that? I bet you guys didn't know that. We're actually a liberal art. I mean, I took, like, we have to sort of take logic classes and philosophy classes to get our degree. However, that, you know, uh, and by the way, do you know that UC Santa Cruz, the mascot is the banana slug? We were like one of the three weirdest mascots in the, in the country. And if you've ever, and here's why that's the mascot of University of California Santa Cruz. University of California Santa Cruz was sort of the least respectable of the University of California campuses. It was known as Uncle Charlie's Summer Camp. It's a UCSC, right? And it's set in a redwood forest and a lot of kind of hippie, punk rocker, misfit types went to school there. And if you've ever taken mushrooms and stepped on a banana slug, which lives in the, it's a, it's, a, it's a slug this long, bright yellow. If you ever stepped on one barefoot when you're on mushrooms, it's a very unpleasant experience. So hence, it's our mascot. <laughs> I programmed computers at first when I first got out of college. Now, I program computers for a farm. This is, it's, one of the many contradictions. Of course, farms in California are giant agricultural uh, conglomerates, typically, and they're really just 
highly automated production and packaging facilities. So I was a geek. But even in 1990s, when I'm hiring Harry Dean Stanton to be in a video, I'm at home in my basement hooking old acoustic modems to amateur radios and laptops and primitive GPS devices. And I was part of an amateur radio group that developed this, uh, or helped develop this. Oh, um, it's, it's a secret internet, basically. You know, think of Dale from King of the Hill in his basement. This is what he's doing, okay? But, like, even when I was the peak of our stardom, I'm still in the basement hanging out with my friends, talking to them, keyboard to keyboard, on sort of like our parallel version of the internet through amateur radio. I still dabble uh, from time to time in technology. Uh, I had, I've advised for several startups that have become, one of which went public, which is Groupon. I'm on the board of this incubator, technology incubator in Athens, Georgia. I teach at University of Georgia. Uh, I'll explain that later. Uh, is it, do any of you use Reverb.com? Reverb.com, right? Vertical competitor to eBay? Okay, well, I'm one of the investors in that. So um, uh, I'm in the technology business, so it's, it's kind of a shame that the technology industry criticizes me so much, but fuck them, who cares? Um, <laughs> so uh, proof's in the IPO. Um, artists protesting against digital technologies? No, not actually. They're just protesting against the pay structure. So, you know, that would be like thinking about the railroad workers protesting about against railroad technology. No, they're protesting for better pay and working conditions. So first of all, that's me. So I feel like that these criticisms are based or rooted or founded in something, right? First of all, my definition of, financially, of music business success is just simply a financially sustainable career. That means you can continue to do it, and you can do it for as long as you want. It doesn't mean playing stadiums. I mean, if, if you want to make uh, crazy laptop noise music using Super Collider and, and playing festivals, noise festivals, three or four times a year, if that's your sustainable vision and you can keep doing it, then, then you're a success, right? So. First heresy. We tend to talk a lot these days in the music business about reaching the maximum number of people to get your music exposed to the largest audience and to becoming popular. It's not a popularity contest. And here's the best proof I can offer to you. Thriller is supposedly one of the best-selling if not the best-selling album of all time, Thriller by Michael Jackson. I doubt if 2% of the people in the world actually bought that record. So it's not a popularity contest. A minority of the people in the world bought that album. People in this room, 2% of them probably like your band, but that doesn't matter, okay? 98% of the people probably have never heard of your band, but that doesn't really matter. There are always more people who have never heard of you, and even for successful groups. How many of you heard of Mastodon? Mastodon, okay, there's quite a few of you heard of Mastodon, okay. So I'm in Spain and playing a festival. There's like 30,000 people out there rocking out to Mastodon, but I bet you if you walk like two blocks away, and went to like the little store and, and asked the people working in the store, do you know Mastodon? They'd be like, no, I don't know who Mastodon is. Anyway, most people have never heard of your band. Even if they've heard of your band, the majority will never be interested enough to buy a ticket, stream a song, download a song, or buy a CD or vinyl album. So financially sustainable career doesn't require popularity. It requires you to engage enough like-minded people to sustain your career. And 
You have to understand this. This is what we practiced with Camper Van Beethoven from day one with our independent record label. We knew that we were only going to be in independent record stores, which were maybe 5% of the record stores out up there. Most of them were chains. And we knew that most venues weren't going to play us. We knew that the only place we'd probably get, well, most venues wouldn't book us. We knew that probably the only place we might ever get any radio play was going to be on that small little percentage of college radio stations. And even them, only half of them were maybe play us when we were at our most popular, right? So what we were doing is we were driving around the country trying to engage with like-minded people. And this leads to the first corollary. This leads to this as a corollary. You know what a corollary is? It's a proof. It's a mathematical truth or proof that follows from a previous one. So famous isn't successful. You've heard about these stories of these YouTube stars that are waiting tables. This is actually a sad story where there's like sort of an award show going on for YouTube stars and this YouTube star is actually waiting tables and people think it's a gag that she's, you know, it's basically like a joke, you know, that's somehow part of her, her shtick, right? Market share means nothing. You have to understand this about the music business. Forget about market share. In fact, don't, don't waste your time spending a lot of energy trying to achieve maximum market share because then you're not really, you're, you're wasting time that should be used to engage like-minded people. Apple versus Android. I mean, Android is a way more popular phone platform but the Apple iOS system makes more money with lower market share, right? It's more sustainable. Back in the 90s, Apple had a tiny market share compared to Dell, which was making PCs, but eventually Apple with a smaller market share became much more profitable. Apple still has a smaller market share for phones for tablets and for computers, but they make more money. They're the most valuable company in the world. So market share means nothing. Sustainability matters more. Financially stable career. Okay, so that ties into this. So where is the largest amount of music consumption take place in the world, in the United States, in St. Paul? Is it on Spotify? Is it on iTunes? takes place on YouTube. So, think about this. Say if I sell a CD, if somebody wants a CD or a digital download off my website, my band's website directly to fans, I'll net on that CD around $10.43. How many views on YouTube would I need? Anybody take a guess to make that much money? 13,500. So, that's okay maybe. I mean, I don't know. There's, there's some useful things about YouTube for promotion and such like that. But here's a case where, okay, and by the way, on Spotify it's better. On Apple Music it's a little better. So why buy an album if you can listen to it for free on these other services? You got to do what you got to do, and especially when you're a new band starting out, you need to, we've always given away our music for free just to get people to listen to it. But you have to wonder if ubiquity, by being on all of these services, by going after the largest possible potential market share, if you're actually undermining your own financial stability, your own financial sustainability, right? Does this undermine sales? Does this undermine our goal of having a financially sustainable career? For some pop artists, I mean, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a classic YouTuber and sing Justin Bieber songs 
on YouTube in your bedroom. Uh, I, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's careers for people that are doing that. But if you're mastodon, I don't think this works for you. you know? If you're death grips, I don't know if this works for you. If you're Chad Bundrick, I don't know if this works for you. So here's a strategy to deal with this that I feel like works pretty well, especially if you're more of a niche artist. You put your singles and a couple of album tracks from the free streaming services, practice windowing, sell stuff directly off of your website first, and then later give it to the other services, right? Some people pursue aggressive takedown policies with YouTube. Um, to keep just a few videos there and stuff like that. And I know people that have, they don't like to talk about it because, you know, you don't want to be seen as the person that's pulling down v videos on YouTube. But I know people that are doing this and it's boosting their sales. By making their stuff less ubiquitous, they're making more money through sales and they have a more sustainable career. Nobody will tell you that. Problem with YouTube though is that it's got all this user generated content. It's a tough one. I'm not going to lie to you. That's the biggest problem for the music business right now and for independent niche, niche artists is how to get better revenue out of YouTube. I mean, YouTube, Morgan Stanley estimates that YouTube generates about $8 billion a year for Alphabet slash Google. Um, about 40% of the views are music videos or music video related. So eight billion, but let's less than two hundred fifty million dollars comes back to the music business in total. That's obviously a value gap there. We're missing money there. That's our biggest problem: is to figure out how to get YouTube to match the amount of consumption, the amount of revenue they make. How to get that to come to us as artists? Also. Just as far as ubiquity, ubiquity goes, reject ubiquity. You should really experiment with this. I encourage every young artist to experiment with this. Like, put your stuff on your website and try to sell and stream it from there and own your own fans. Don't get your fans to other platforms. And, you know, of course, the king of scarcity, Prince here, you know, Prince. Prince is the guy on the block that calls the police every time the ball comes into the yard, but it's also kind of awesome that he does that because he's like more ferocious than anybody about protecting his rights. And I don't think it's hurt him. There is no hit machine. These go faster now, by the way. We tend to talk about the music business as if if you put these inputs into one side of this mythical hit machine, out the other side comes sales, popularity, spins, radio play, licensing deals, revenue, right? You're noticing the black ops, the bribes, cocaine, prostitutes, and payola. That, that a, a company that if they put basically all of the, these exact inputs into this machine, out the, for each record, out the other side would become the exact same number of sales. We talk about the music business. I mean, this is absurd, okay? We know this is absurd, but often we talk about the music business as if this actually happens, okay? And it, it traps us into some bad thinking. First of all, we know that that wouldn't really happen, that, that it would look more like this, this is normal or Gaussian variation, right? But in actuality, this is what we get, uh, this wild variation. And by the way, this chart is compressed logarithmically, so really those spikes go up about uh, 400 feet in the air. Um, and what this, without going into the long mathematical inductive reasoning on this, what this says is that the inputs have very little effect on the outputs. So, the music business, it's not that it's random, it's just that it's unpredictable, turbulent, chaotic, irreducibly complex. 
Have you ever read Mixer Man Diary? Mixer Man Diaries is awesome. The Daily Adventures of Mixer Man, you should read that. If, okay, well, he basically gives you the strategy right here. Discographies are the name of the game in this business. The deeper and hotter your discography is, the better. The recording business, business is basically a small controlled lottery. The more albums I work on in the course of a year, the more lottery tickets I have in my possession. The more lottery tickets, the more chances of a hit. So strategy, get as many lottery tickets as possible. Make as many recordings, play as many shows, write as many songs as possible. That's all there is. That's the only strategy there is. Here's the thing I said that was going to be contradictory. Never listen to successful people in the music business. They are often mistaken about the reasons for their success. And this has to do with some quirks of human nature and how our brain works. Okay. First of all, the music business is a black swan business. The natural state is failure. Most of the songs you write fail. Most of the recordings you put out fail. Most of the shows you do don't really have any effect on your overall career. Hits are the exceptions. Hits are dominated, are produced by luck more than they are by skill. I mean, successful people often exhibit more skill but it's just not the main determining factor for success. Successful people are often lucky, not necessarily skilled. That's why it's dangerous to first approach successful people for success. But then there's also this, whereby these, four, these three logical fallacies and another social effect called the Matthew effect make us think, they make us create these false narratives that explain why we were successful. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these right now, but I will get to this one. The narrative fallacy addresses our limited ability to look at sequences of facts without weaving an explanation into them, or equivalently forcing a logical link and arrow of relationship upon them. Ex Explanations bind facts together. They make them all the more easily remembered. They help them make more sense. Where this propensity can go wrong is when it increases our impression of understanding. Okay. This is from Nassim Taleb's The Black Swan. What, what this does, here, let me give you the example. Here's a platinum selling album of mine. We had these three giant hits off this album. We were selling like 20,000 records a week, something like that, right? And I found myself telling this competitive, compelling narrative, success narrative to people over and over again about how this record became such a great hit. Well, because I'm a geek, I have emails going back to 1993. One day, I was reading about the narrative fallacy. I go, hmm, I wonder if that's true. And I go back and look. I'm aware of this. And I go back and I look at this. We didn't even discuss any three of these songs except for the one song, Euro Trash Girl, which, which half of us wanted to delete from the record, not use on the album. So everything I said about how we became successful was not true. However, take advice from unsuccessful people. And it's very simple. Unsuccessful people know exactly where they went wrong. They're dealing with the known knowns, okay? Number six, streaming is not the future of the music industry. In 2005, you can go back, you can Google this. In 2005, MySpace was the future of the music industry. There were conferences in which panels were titled this. In 1998, CDs were the future of the music industry. 100 years before that, it was the player piano. No technology is ever the future of the music business. Just understand that music is the future of the music business. Here are just some of the ascendant technologies in my father-in-law's lifetime. I picked my father-in-law because he was married to, his wife worked at Sun, Sun Records. So these are just some of the things that in his lifetime he has seen. Here are simply the ascendant subgenres of rock, 1980 to 2000. 
Number seven, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Social media algorithms amplify things that make a large splash, not a thousand little ripples. When the algorithms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, detect something is making a splash, it amplifies it and shows it to more people. If you're always constantly on the social media services, you're just kind of making a little ribble. It's, it's like instead of, you know, instead of throwing a bunch of pebbles into a pond, take all those pebbles, put them into a big bag, stick a television in there and a bowling ball as well, and then throw it into the pond. It'll make a big, bigger ripple. Hyperactive social media activity is counterproductive, but it depends on what you're doing, okay? Comedians are always really good at having this hyperactive social media presence. It doesn't work so good for musicians. Go away sometimes. Embrace the album cycle. It's great for a band to just appear for 18 months and then come back with an album. Everybody's like, hey, they're back. The new record sucks. <laughs> but we'll all talk about it on social media. It's fantastic. Fuck you, pay me, okay? <laughs> I don't understand. I keep hearing people saying, I'm not in this for the money. Or I'm not doing this because of the money. Or the money is not really a concern. This is the number one rule of the music business. It's fuck you, pay me. Stop giving away your music. Unless you have a trust fund, you need money to sustain your art. This is just an empirical observation, but I've only heard white people in rock bands say they don't care about the money, and they're lying, okay? <laughs> they're promoting our music. No. You are building someone else's platform and making them rich. Stop making other people rich. Make yourself rich. People who won't pay for your record, buy a concert ticket, or pay for a streaming service are not your fans. Don't worry about them. Fuck you. Heresy. Musicians are not Luddites. Musicians pioneered the web and they continue to lead the way, but the, every technology article talks about musicians not understanding technology. Every one of you understands technology better than your average straight Joe walking down the street, okay? Who had the first website, Cracker or Coca-Cola? Cracker did. Well, we didn't have the first website, but we had a website before Coca-Cola did. You ever hear of The Well? This is the first, first computer network sort of social media site. It was founded with money from the Grateful Dead. They were highly involved in this. Think about it. Musicians and bands have been internet enabled since AOL and bulletin boards, listservs, Usenet, email. That was 92, 93. Web-enabled since the first browser came out in 93. Web-based since Napster. The majority of your interactions with your fans happen on the web since then. Social media pioneers. Friendster, we all laugh about it. But musicians, MySpace became big because they figured out that musicians were the main, trying to hook up with their fans were using Friendster a lot, so the MySpace made themselves musician friendly. They put band pages on there and they killed Friendster, right? Pioneers of crowdfunding, that's how the point comes about, that's how Groupon comes about. Um, and let's not forget that many of these innovations are actually coming from the older musicians. Of course, Daryl Hall, Daryl's place. I mean, come on, man, he wrote the book on how to make money off of the web. How to revitalize your career using the web, starting in 2007. Finally, last year, your band's net profit was millions of dollars higher than virtually every music tech company. Did you know that? Because they all lose millions and millions and millions of dollars a year. Why are we listening to them? I'd rather listen to you guys than I would to like some Silicon Valley music tech tycoon who is losing millions of dollars a year. Finally, 
Big data will save the music business. This is the number one talk and my pet peeve right now. Big data, Taylor Swift and the future of the music business. Remember, it said South by Southwest. Okay, first of all, here's the problem. Nate Silver said this, there's exponential growth in new data and there's little growth in new truths. It's, I love that. But this is the problem. 10% of the artists generate 90% of the music business revenue. We already have plenty of data on the top 10 artists through these things called SoundScan, Polestar, Ticketmaster, BDS, right? So all big data is doing is tr trying to apply to that last 10% of the music business where there really isn't very much money. Is it interesting? Yes. Is it useful? No. For instance, if you call my wife who books the 40 Watt Club and you say Pandora Amp, Data says we have 64 active listeners in Northeast Georgia. That's great. Will she book you? No. I mean, she needs 200 people to walk through the door for her to make money. Maybe the Caledonia would book you? Yeah, they might. 60 people will walk through the door. That, that, that might work for the Caledonia, which is a smaller sister club to the 40 Watt. But you don't know what that 64 means. I mean, how engaged of listeners are. Are you their favorite band in the whole wide world? Or are you, I mean, anyway, this is the deal with big data. Let me just lay it out for you. Big data is future of music industry. The translation for that is we are a music tech startup and our venture capital backers are demanding we figure out how to make a profit now. <laughs> That's it. Use time spent crunching data, writing and recording music. By the way, this is not a Bob Lefset style, be excellent advice. You know, he's always telling people, just be excellent, write great stuff. I'm not telling you to do that. I want you to write more stoner doom metal. <laughs> write another dope smoker by sleep, please. Do some neo retro chill wave like Toro y Moi, okay? Do some experimental hip hop. Make some incomprehensible music people won't understand for decades. Thank you, okay. And now I'm supposed to play, wait, here's my walkout music. Oh, come on, you gotta go to page, come on. Uh, this, this suspense is killing me, it's really underrated. <laughs> Thank you.